indeed our Savior Jesus is that uh, beautiful God. I'm very glad that I'm hearing that uh, beautiful song just now. Are you guys glad that uh, the song being sung just now? Yes, right? Christ is that beautiful God who knows every one of us in a very special way. Huh? <laughs> Christ is that Savior who knows you and I personally and he wants to be part of our life personally, daily, every seconds of our life. I'm uh, very happy this morning because of this beautiful Sabbath day. The weather is nice. I was uh, in uh, last Wednesday, I was in Botin Nickel Garden doing my morning exercise. I brought along my young boy in the stroller. And among all those beautiful sceneries, one particular tree captured my attention. I do not know whether all of you who went there noticed that there is this one nice, beautiful tree blooming with uh, pinkish fluorescent, so-called fluorescent flowers everywhere. The entire tree covered by this flower. Among all the green trees stood one particular impressive, elegant, gorgeous tree. And many people, including uh, tourists, want to go to that uh, particular tree just to take picture. Just to take picture of that tree. Well, we have no more flowers outside. Uh, all the flowers fell. Um, but that uh, scenery really um, captured my attention. I believe, as Sabbath keepers, among all the denomination that we have in this world, God is looking at this church and all these Sabbath keepers, I believe, as that one beautiful tree. And all of you are flowers, are gems in His eyes. Amen? amen. Only one strong amen. <laughs> amen, church? Amen. So this morning, I uh, want to uh, share a sermon entitled, The Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Not the Holy, but the Holy Spirit. Before I start with my sermon, I would like to begin with a simple quiz. What's going to happen on the 30th of this month in uh, Econ? From 7.30 p.m. to uh, 9.30? What's going to happen? What's uh, the event? Come on, come, one brave soul, raise up your hand and uh, tell to the church what's going to happen on the 30th of March. Oh, come on, don't look at your bulletin now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's being announced many times. <laughs> and the flyers have been um, uh, distributed. Mm-hmm. What happened to this church? What happened to us? Are we having that fellowship, quality fellowship, that we know what happened? Well, another one that's going to happen in April 26. Uh huh. You better get to know that one also. If not, we're going to have a church without uh, quality fellowship. <laughs> What's going to happen, church, on the 30th? Ah, oh, we're going to have concert. Uh, Justin smile from ear to ear. <laughs> yeah, we need to support this as a church, as a body, 
of uh, believers. This is our event. This is our event. Let's fellowship there in Econ. In March 30th. Bring your friends along. We will have a grand fellowship there. I've uh, uh, indirectly heard the, oh, directly, you know, especially the, uh, the uh, ensemble, the music that they're going to uh, present at that moment. It's going to be like that tree, I believe. Please come. See, even Brother Justin uh, wear uh, pink uh, long sleeves like that. Uh, one tree in that in botanical garden. No more sound. I lost my... This is not MH370, yeah? We ought to pray for these uh, families and these uh, people. The Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Well, according to uh, research... A dying church will have, will have these uh, symptoms. Or, there are one particular article that I've read. This is the opto- uh, autopsy for a dead church. Also can be. Number one, leadership is gridlocked. There's a lot of division. Lack of respect. Among each other's members, membership, no real growth for the last five years or seven years. Number three, your vision is in the rear view mirror, not the windshield. I want to uh, praise the Lord for the fast team, for the effort, especially, of course. All uh, the church leaders who involved in um, looking forward for our mission and vision. Is the church being a part of this movement? Or only a handful of us? This is our hope and prayer that hopefully everyone is being part of this. I still remember one day, no, <laughs> those years when I was the youth leader in Penang Adventist Hospital Church. We s- s- uh, started, uh, yeah, the Pathfinder group, and at that very beginning we have like uh, 20 people, but at the end of uh, 2005, it's like 90%. 95% of the church are all pathfinders and master guides. Whenever we perform, nobody, no audience. No audience. Because everyone is on stage. Mm. That is not a good uh, uh, nurturing or not a good uh, sowing. We need uh, the fast people to come in in that kind of situation. Number four, you've lost the ability to attract quality staff. One question to be asked, maybe, do pastors love to come here and pastor this church? Or if we have uh, vacant on certain departments, is it easy to find somebody else to replace? Oh, we are struggling to find staff or leaders. Number five, leadership can never be changed. At the first moment when he or she being elected, well, the song is, Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? But after 20 years or 30 years, I shall not be moved. Yes, I shall not be moved. (laughs) Well, I believe a healthy church is a church that trains young leaders. 
to replace and replace for continuous growth. Members are uh, content with being pew warmers. The members had uh, more and more arguments about what they wanted. It intrigued me, in particular, uh, number seven, when I read that article. It says, churches that have plenty of meetings and even church business meetings. <laughs> number eight, the church really prayed together. This is a need here, I believe. A need here. I just want to praise the Lord for Sister Michelle Ten because, because she brought this up when we have our, uh, our meeting, the, the music uh, committee meeting. And uh, I believe this is a wonderful challenge to all of us. Number nine, the members idolized another era. I've, uh, as I, especially when I work with young people, um, small group of people, and we lack a lot of things. And youth leaders came from various places in, around Malaysia and they become part of our group. And they will say, oh, we do better. Our church do like this. But what I normally respond to these wonderful people is that it's time to perform here. The past is the past. What you have gained in those churches, bring it here and even make it more flourish in this church. And um, number 10, does my church look more like a caring community or less? Do we have fellowship, enough fellowship? I want us to, uh, in particular, ponder upon the word fellowship, which derives from the word koinonia in Greek. And it is used, different version, different numbers, 19 or 20 times in the New Testament. Koinonia, the root word koinos, means um, living, owning a purse, a dispute, and Mother, to uh, enlarge the de definition or the meaning, living in community together, owning a purse in common, a public dispute, and having a mother in common. Fellowship, <laughs> according to the word koinonia, to hold something in common. We will explore this more. Number two, biblical meaning of uh, the word fellowship. The usage of the word fellowship, koinonia, was used to describe cooperation, labor guilds, uh, partners in a law firm, and the most intimate of marriage relationships. So it has this spectrum of meaning in the word of, uh, in this uh, koinonia word itself. Fellowship is just one particular uh, meaning in that vast meaning of the word. A relationship that is dependent on more than one individual. Koinonia is an interdependent relationship. If the attitude is to want to be sendirian berhad, to want to do things my own way. That is not the spirit of koinonia. Number three. This is the experience in the New Testament, the early church, 
a community life with the Holy Spirit. No more, no less. It's because of the Holy Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit, then this group of people experience koinonia, fellowship. That's why they are able to go from synagogue to synagogue, from house to house, doing their caring in a small group because they understood the meaning of koinonia. Fellowship was never used to describe man's relationships, relationship to God before the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell the church. This is an exclusively post-Pentecost relationship. We are part of it. Part of it. Are we experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit? We've been praying as a global church for that 777. I hope we will continue that because I believe that is very vital to experience koinonia. So that next time when I stand here and I ask what's going to happen on April 26, everyone will know because we have this fellowship. And when I ask what is the vision and mission of this church, everyone will know because we have this fellowship. And when I ask uh, Brother Jace or Brother uh, Albin, how many people in the group, in the discipling program, the whole church? <laughs> because we experience that fellowship in the spirit number four there are at least four words that uh, fit in those spectrum of meaning of the word koinonia number one philos related by love for outward characteristics hetairos a sharer in common in a common enterprise. So Nergos, a fellow worker. Metokos, a participant. In First uh, Corinthians chapter one verse nine, God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and other texts that uh, support the same meaning. When we read or when we understand these four uh, Greek words, it gives us the uh, connotation that uh, something that is outwardly, but actually it is very much inwardly. An inner relationship which is at the root of fellowship. What is that inner relationship? Our personal relationship with? With Christ. With the Holy Spirit inside of us. This is very um, important to understand. When God, Christ, is inside of us and we experience koinonia with Him within us, then we will see how He can move us to koinonia with other people. To koinonia with other people. We have this unity with Christ in our heart. And we have this collective unity as we allow this inner relationship, this intimacy that we have with Christ in us, it will be shown as we interact with other people, other church members. Number five, it is primarily an action word. It's not uh, sitting down. It's not uh, theory. Just theory. 
but it is very much practical, very much doing. Koinonia is used 19 or 20 times in the New Testament and in addition, addition, uh, additional translation, uh, these are the words that are being used besides fellowship, contribution, sharing, participation. Fellowship is not just being together. It is doing together. A point that frequently ignored. Sometimes we have this attitude, we wait other people to do. Then we will move. But if we have that inner relationship with the Holy Spirit, with Christ, we ourselves will be moved to experience koinonia. The early church, they experienced a lot of challenges, even much more than what we have now. But they move forward zealously because they experience Christ in a very powerful within them, powerful, powerful way within them. And it flourishes the whole group of believers. So it is doing together, not one or two person, but doing together. On the 30th March, I hope that this doing together will happen because we've been uh, distributing flyers, we've been uh, having this personal contacts with people, we've been inviting other churches, even other denominations, we've been doing our part and we we want every one of you to be there to koinonia with these people. Pray that the Holy Spirit will move them to come. And that is that uh, golden moments that you and I can fellowship, can koinonia with these people. Number six, it is not just doing anything together. Our fellowship with others, there is this uh, connection between these two. Our fellowship with Christ, like what I've uh, described just now. We have this inner fellowship with Christ. That's what we do to others also. If it is that easy for us to say, I love you, Jesus. I want to do your will. And as we mingle upon, mingle with many, with others, I hope we have this um, easiness also in using our words that we love everyone, even those people who are difficult to love. How about in the church? Do we have koinonia? Participate with Him in doing God's will. We must quit thinking of Christian fellowship as primarily doing things such as having potluck, dinners, or watching football, or playing basketball with other believers. That is not koinonia. That is not fellowship. That's what the word means. Fellowship involves actively doing God's will. It is only doing God's will together, only then we can capture the real meaning of fellowship or koinonia. I've been uh, um, hearing that uh, we need more fellowship in this church. Normally, uh, like, uh, well, maybe I'm wrong, 30% of us will be in the potluck. But the rest, we will attend church and we will say bye-bye at the end of the service. And we will meet again next week. 
but there is no real fellowship. But I believe personally, if we have that inner relationship, that koinonia with Christ within us, we are more than willing to fellowship with everyone. It is our priority in life. It is our priority in Christian living. So, I uh, put it into one PowerPoint. Biblical meaning of fellowship. To hold something in common. Interdependent relationship. Post-Pentecost relationship. The Holy Spirit is working uh, among this early church. And I believe that is everyone's desire here. That we want this Holy Spirit, the one that uh, bring us this powerful koinonia together, doing God's will together. So as we combine all these six uh, points, it can be stated like this. You can state it in a different way. It's okay. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Fellowship is a relationship of inner unity among believers that expresses itself in outer cooperation with Christ and one another in accomplishing God's will on earth. What is the purpose of us being in the church? Actually, that is one of among the list of uh, the sign of a dying church. If somebody comes to you and asks, what is the purpose of you being part of this church? What is the purpose of this church? If you have difficulty of answering, then I should put number 11. Number 11. I believe it's not hard to answer that, yeah? Because we have Jesus in us. Yeah, and I believe every one of you have that uh, special relationship with Christ. And I believe every one of us yearns cooperate um, in a cooperate way to work together because I believe the time is very short and just plenty of work to do. Two slides to end. <laughs> Fellowship, God's way of accomplishing His plan of glorifying Christ. It's all about Christ. Why we fellowship? Because we feel Him inside of us. We experience Him. And we want to bring this Christ to other people among us. And it will help us for our mission and vision. If we cannot see fellowship happens in this church, as what the Bible mentioned, as what the early church experienced, even after the 3,000 being baptized, then it's going to be very hard for all of us. It's going to be very, very hard. We will move on forward dragging and dragging. Our memory verse, our text this morning, let me read it again. Uh, before that, fellowship occurred naturally as a result of the establishment of the church. This is very, very profound to me. Actually, if we form a church, automatically, <laughs> if the Spirit is within, we will experience fellowship. If we experience the lack of the power of the Holy Spirit, then we will experience divisions 
we will experience sendirian berhad. My way, your way. And those, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Verse 45, let me uh, elaborate that a little bit. It's not compulsory. That's what the verse is saying. I'm not saying that all of us start to uh, sell all of our things. Or the, the, the verse, do not say that every one of us sell everything and give to the poor. This is voluntarily as the Spirit moves you. And I believe there are plenty of opportunities to do this. The poor is always with us, as Jesus mentioned. 46. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. <laughs> Last night during our TT meeting, we explored this. And I told uh, the rest of the group, <laughs> I will <laughs> um, bring something. I hope it is new for all the TT graduates. Huh, Jess? <laughs> okay. uh, this breaking of bread as what I've uh, uh, researched, it's not the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion. It is plainly about fellowshipping, eating together. But there, this statement, phrase, is not being used here, but a few times in the New Testament. Breaking of bread, meaning that it can be two meanings, whether it is, either it is, um, Lord's Supper itself, communion service, or just a normal uh, get-together and eating together. 47, uh, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. 3,000 and some more being aid and in. Wonderful. Yeah, I would like to close with this. Fellowship is the is indispensable meanings, means of accomplishing uh, the God-given purpose of the church. If we do not have this unity, this community, this love in the koinonia, it's just hard. To move forward. I would like to invite the whole church to read with me. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 8 to 11. Let us read together. To me, the very least of all saints. Eleven. Together, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which He carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's become so natural in them because of the moving of the Holy Spirit in them, because of Christ that they have so intimately in their heart. How to do this then? What the purpose of uh, studying about koinonia? How to make it practical in my life? 
Well, I believe let's uh, ponder this in a very simplistic way. We, every one of us, must know what is the goal of the church, meaning that the vision and mission of the church. I believe this church is moving towards that. I hope that every one of us will find time to know and understand and to meet with leaders in this church to be able to understand fully where we are heading. And secondly, practice fellowship by taking an active part where you are, where you can best help with this goal. Every one of us, given by God the ability of doing many things, different things, and find ways how you can fit in. I believe there are plenty of rooms here, even in the training part, even in the evangelistic part, sewing part. Everyone can be fit in. But unless you know what is the goal, mission and vision of this church. I would like to leave this uh, thought to every one of you by uh, closing with a simple illustration. In 2004, tsunami came. A group of us, 40 of us, supposed to go to Fringi Beach. My family from Sabah came and the hospital church family. And at, from 2 until 4 in the morning, something some from above speaks to me to change the location from Frankie Beach to Taiping Zoo. Zoo. Taiping Zoo. And 5.30 in the morning, I contacted uh, everyone who organized this. I said, change! Change! After we felt that trauma, every one of us runs down. I contacted, uh, I, actually I don't have any clue that the tsunami will come. But I said, something tells me that we need to change from Frenge to Taiping Zoo. Oh, I've, I experienced that uh, rejection so hard. No koinonia at all. Everyone is blaming me. Why you change that location? But at the end of the day, I managed to get an express bus and every one of us was in and we go. And we have quite an enjoyable time there. During our way back, 1.30 in the afternoon, everyone's handphone starts, started to ring. And we hear this news upon news. Tsunami! If we were at Ferengi Beach, my life will not be the same at this moment. And I believe God is telling us something that a tsunami will come. If we do not listen to the Holy Spirit, God bless.